So I did say that I was going to talk about tithing. Does tithing apply today? Well, many preachers say it does. Let's see where they get their justification for taking your money and calling it tithes? All right, this is by Jeremy Myers, Pastoral Pay and the Levitical Priesthood. So right away, as you can see, they are likening themselves as the Levitical priesthood. Having looked at briefly at pastoral pay in a previous post, I now want to address several of the passages that churches and pastors use to defend the practice of paying a pastor. We might be surprised to discover what these texts actually teach. For the first passage is not really a passage, but a biblical example, that of the Levitical priesthood. Some pastors point to the Levitical priesthood as proof that spiritual leaders should have their needs met by the people they serve. The passages such as Numbers 18 and Deuteronomy 18 are often referenced in support of this idea. Now, what I want to do then before I go to Numbers 18 and Deuteronomy 18, I want to go to Deuteronomy 12. So here in Deuteronomy 12, it begins this. These are the statutes and judgments which you shall do to do, which you shall observe to do in the land which Jehovah, not the Lord, Jehovah Elohim, all of your forefathers gave to you to possess in all the days that you live upon the Aretz. Now, the problem is with you Christians, you think that that means the earth, the globe. No. That is, well, actually, this is the Adma. All right? And this is still in reference to the land of Israel. All right. It says, you shall utterly destroy all the places where the Gentiles, which you shall possess, serve their idols upon the high mountains, upon the hills, and under every green tree, specifically the evergreen trees, and you shall overthrow their altars and break their pillars, their monuments, and burn their groves with fire, and you shall cut down the graven images, you know, kind of like the graven images that you Christians worship every Sunday, of their idols, and destroy the names of them out of that place. Unto the place which Jehovah Elohim shall choose out of all of your tribes to put his name there, even his habitation you will seek, there you shall come. Where? It's right here in 1 Kings 8. As you can see, the Ark of the Covenant enters the temple. Where was the temple located? Well, David provided the provisions of the material to build the temple. Solomon had it built. The city of David, which is Zion, that would be Jerusalem. This is the place where Jehovah chose to place his name. Right here it says in verse 18, And Jehovah said unto David my father, Whereas it was in your heart to build a house unto my name, you did well. It was right, you were right in your heart. Nevertheless, you shall not build this house, but your son shall come forth from your loins. He shall build this house unto my name. And Jehovah has performed this word, and he spoke, and, says, and I am risen up in the room of David, my father, and I sit on the throne of Israel. This is Solomon speaking. As Jehovah promised, and have built a house for the name of Jehovah Elohim of Israel. And I have set there a place for the Ark of the Covenant, wherein was the covenant of Jehovah, which he made 
with our fathers when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. And then you have the prayer of dedication. Right, and this is, this is the place that Jehovah chose to place his name. Verse 9, for when you come to the rest and in your inheritance, which Jehovah gives you, when you go over the Jordan and dwell in the land, which Jehovah Elohim gives you to inherit, and when he gives you rest from all your enemies round about, so that you dwell safely, then there shall be a place which Jehovah Elohim shall choose to cause his name to dwell there. There you will bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, and your tithes. Okay? There. That at, at the time when the dedication of the temple occurred, there was no other place. That was it. No other place is appointed to bring tithes. You see, tithes were brought to a place. And the heave offering of your hand, of all your choice vows which you vow unto Jehovah. And you shall rejoice before Jehovah Elohim and your sons and your daughters and your men servants and your maid servants and the Levite that is within your gates. Because he has no part nor inheritance with you. He did not, they did not inherit any land. Take heed to yourself that you offer not your burnt offerings in any old place that you see. So once, listen to me carefully. You cannot bring your offerings unto Jehovah to any other place except for Jerusalem. Your offerings or your tithes can only be brought to one place, that is Jerusalem. Take heed to yourself that you offer not your burnt offering in any place that you see fit. Only in the place where Jehovah shall choose in one of your tribes. That would have been in the land of Judah. Jerusalem. There you shall offer your burnt offerings, and there you will do those things that I commanded you, the tithes, the heave offerings, and stuff like that. No other place! Notwithstanding, you may kill and eat flesh in all your gates, whatever your soul desires, according to the blessing of Jehovah Elohim, that which he gives you, the unclean and the clean you may eat, may eat thereof as a roebuck as the heart. What in the world is he saying the unclean? That's for another subject. Don't eat the blood, you shall pour it out upon the earth as water. You may not eat within the gates, within your gates, the tithe of the corn and of the wine or of the oil of the first things of your herds or your flock. Does it say tithes of your wages? No, it does not. Tithes? Do not, don't, don't you try, you preachers. I know some of you preachers are listening. Do not try to wiggle your way out of this one because right down here at the bottom of this chapter, checkmate, there's no wiggle room. The tithing is specific. The tithe of your grain, of your grapes, your wine, of your oil, that would be your olive oil, or the firstlings of your herd, that would be the first one that opens the matrix, as it, as, as it is written in Old English, or of your flock, or of any vows which you vowed, nor of your free will offerings or heave offerings of your hand. Now, heave offering is a tithe of the tithe. Now that is specific to the Levites who have to who have to take a tithe 
of those items which he mentioned, not money, but a tithe of what they received from the people of Israel, they have to tithe of that and give it to the sons of Aaron, the priests, uh, the, the, the sons of Aaron. That is your heave offering. But you must eat them before Jehovah. So you, the tithes must be eaten before Jehovah Elohim in the place which Jehovah Elohim shall choose. It can only be eaten in Jerusalem. You and your son and your sons and your daughters and your manservants and your paid servants and the Levites that within, within your gate shall rejoice before Jehovah Elohim and all that you put your hands unto. Take heed to yourself that you do not forsake the Levite as long as he lives upon the Adma. Now let's scroll down here, very right, right down here. Verse 32. All these things that I have just commanded you, you observe to do it, you shall not add, and neither shall you take away from it. If he says only in the place which Jehovah has chosen, then it's only in the place that Jehovah has chosen. And the tithes was only the firstling of the flock. That's the first one that the cow has, the heifer has, that's the first one, or the tithes of your grain, your wine, and your olive oil. Very specific. You may not add thereto, nor diminish from it. Therefore, there is no tithe on wages. And even Yehoshua said to the Pharisees, you tithe of the mint and the anise. And you should. But you should not have left the weightier things undone. That is, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I don't need to go to Numbers anymore. I don't even need to go to Deuteronomy 18. Why? Because you just heard the answer. Now, let's look at Hebrews 7. Concerning Melchizedek, the king of Salem, who came to, to see Abraham after Abraham defeated um, it, uh, the returning of the slaughter of the kings, and he blessed him. And Abraham gave a tenth part of, it says all, but it was of the spoils, the spoils of war. You can, you can read, it, read that in uh, Genesis. Now, People misinterpret what Paul says here, and they stumble upon it, just like they stumble upon all the other scriptures. His title is King of Salem. His title, Melchizedek, was King of Peace. His title, it says, without father, but fatherless, motherless, without descent. So apparently this king his mother and father passed away when he was young. And he did not have any offspring. Now it says, having neither beginning. That could be interpreted as a birthday. Now it says, nor end of life. But wait a minute. See, so you see what Paul just did here? But made like unto the son of Elohim. That would be Yehoshua. So what he is saying is, Yehoshua 
was after the order of Melchizedek. How can you say nor or, nor end of life? Well, Yehoshua did have an end of life. He was in the ground for three days and three nights, was it? Now was he not? That's uh, no, nor forever ending of life. But I don't want to uh, harp on this point right now. The, 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 the tithing point is what I'm getting into. Now consider how great this man was, even whom the patriarch. Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. Like I said, it was a tenth of the spoils of the war. And, and look, the sons of Levi who received the office of the priesthood have a commandment to take the tithes of the people according to the Torah, that is, of their brethren. Of the brethren? That's of the people of Israel. So now another qualifier is only the people of Israel gave the tithes. And only the Levites received the tithes. That means the Gentiles were not in the equation. It was never commanded that the Gentiles pay tithes. The Torah, that is, of their brethren, even though they came out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descendant is not counted of them received tithes of Abraham. So he was, who that was not a descendant of Abraham received tithes from Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. Now, not to contradict, it says the smaller is blessed by the greater. Well, because Melchizedek, king of Salem, he was the priest of the Most High, or that was his title. And here men that die receive tithes. That would be the Levites received tithes. But there he received him of whom is witness that he lives. What is he saying? Remember, the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek, and he's going to get to that. Please don't let this confuse you. And as I may say so, Levi also, who received tithes, paid tithes while he was in Abraham's loins. To who? Melchizedek. Or I should say, the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. You see, the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek, that is the one without father, without mother, without descendant, and that lives forever, the priesthood. For he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Now, if perfection were by the Le Levitical priesthood, for under it the people of Israel received the Torah, what further need was there for another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek and not after the order of Aaron? See, folks, please do not stumble over Paul's words. Paul had his way of speaking. For the priesthood being changed, there was also made a necessity of change also of the Torah. Because he of whom these things are spoken of in the prophets, like in Isaiah, pertains to a different tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar, at the altar at Jerusalem, at the temple. For it is evident that our Moshiach sprang out of Judah, which, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood. And it is far more evident that for that after the similitude of Melchizedek arises another priest. So, after the similitude, after the order of Melchizedek arises another priest who is made not after the Torah of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. Now, she should make sense to you. Now, if you're just going to sit here and stumble over the previous words that he said up here, that Paul said up here, then I, I don't know how to help you. 
Now, for he testifies, you are a priest forever, forever, that can no longer die, and it is after the order of Melchizedek. So that, too, is to where the no end of life is, is, pertains to. He is not Melchizedek. He is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going forth because of the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. Because the Torah made nothing perfect, but bringing in a better hope did, by which we draw nigh unto Jehovah, inasmuch as not without an oath, not without an oath, that means with an oath, inasmuch with an oath he was made priest. The oath was this. For those priests, the, the Levites and the sons of Aaron, were made a without an oath. They were made priests without an oath. But this is with an oath by him that said unto him, Jehovah swore and will not repent. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now that all should make sense to you. By so much was not Jesus. No. Yehoshua. See that right there? Yehoshua. By that, Yehoshua was made a security, a guarantee for a better, not testament, for a better covenant. And those truly were made many priests because they had, were not allowed to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he is also able to save them to the utmost. That come unto Jehovah by him, seeing that he lives to make intercession for them. Now, listen carefully. For such a high priest, suitable for us, he is righteous, pious, and holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who does not need daily. Why were the Levites supposed to take tithes because they had daily needs. Why were, was the sons of Aaron, why were the sons of Aaron supposed to take tithes from the Levites because they had daily needs? You just read it. We just read it in Deuteronomy. Who needs not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered himself up. For the Torah makes men high priests who have infirmity, but the word of the oath, which was with the Torah, makes the son who is consecrated forevermore. What was, let's look at, the, let's find this oath. For those priests, Jehovah swore and will not, will not repent. You are a priest forever. All right, let's look it up. Priest forever. It is in Psalm 110, verse 4. Psalm of David, not the Lord, Jehovah, said unto Adon, Is this past tense from David, or is this future tense? It was future tense from David. Jehovah said unto Adon, Sit 
at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Not the Lord, Jehovah, shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. That's written right there in Hebrews 11. For out of Zion shall come the deliverer. Okay. Verse 26 says, And so all Israel shall be saved, for out of Zion shall come the deliverer that will turn unholiness from Jacob. Verse 27, For this is my covenant unto them when I shall for, uh, take away their sins. All right. You shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule you in the midst of your enemies. Your people will be willing in the day of your power and in the beauties of the holiness from the womb of the morning and the dew of your youth. Jehovah has sworn and will not repent. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Let's, let's, not, let's not stop right here. Adonai, Adonai. Now, wait a minute. Listen. This is Adon. Now, Adon is in reference to the Messiah, and Adonai is in reference to Jehovah. You've got to understand this thing, these things, folks. So, Adonai, right hand, his, his right hand, who is his right hand? That would be the one who sits on his right hand. Adonai's right hand shall strike through the kings in the day of his wrath. What is the day of his wrath? Look at the sixth seal. Sixth seal, and you will find it. He is going to judge the Gentiles. And he will fill, fill the place with dead bodies. And he is going to strike through the heads of many nations. All right. He will judge the heathen, the Gentiles, and fill the place with, uh, it just says, fill dead bodies, he will to strike through, shatter the heads of many lands. Many lands. Okay. So, this is in reference to the Gog-Magog War. Read Ezekiel 39. And you will see that this is true. So, even King James knows that this is concerning the Messiah. Let's see what uh, Paul says in uh, Hebrews 5. Was I just in Hebrews 5? No, I was not. All right. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men and things pertaining to Jehovah, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins, who can have compassion on the ignorant and upon them that are wandering, for that he himself is also compassed with infirmity. By reason hereof he ought to ask for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. This was the Levites. And no man takes this honor unto himself, but he that is called of Jehovah, as was Aaron. So, not Christ, but Moshiach glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he that said unto him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And he said also in a different passage. Which one? Psalm 110. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his infirmity, his flesh, 
when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard that he feared, though he were a son, learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of an eternal salvation unto them that obey him, called of Jehovah a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, and it should read forever. So why is it, then, that pastors using spiritual Leviticism to justify taking your money. Either if they, if they tell you that they are spiritual Levites and they do so in order to take your money, to justify taking your money, then they have rejected the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. Let me say it again. We just read, we just read in Deuteronomy 12, verse 32, That which thing whatsoever I command you, you observe it, you shall not add to thereof, nor shall diminish from it. Now, there was no oath sworn of the Levitical priesthood would be a priesthood forever. There was not an oath made. There was only one oath made, and that would have been in Psalm 110. He said, he swore this oath, and he will not change. You will be a priest after the order of Melchizedek forever. So if you can't have both, you can't have a Levitical priesthood and also the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. Now, if the preachers out there in any way claim the priesthood of Levi for any reason, any reason, they have rejected the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. In other words, they have rejected Yehoshua, the Messiah. 